Hello, and thank you everyone for joining us in this interview, as others we are carrying out. We're interested in understanding the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on our professional and personal lives from what we call expanded reason. That is, we want to ask about the impact of the pandemic on our lives from the broad horizon of reason, like Pope Benedict would say, moving beyond the narrow scientific perspectives, for example, towards a wider, better understanding of our lives. That is, we hope to see how we live, how we, our lives can be enriched by a deeper engagement with philosophy and theology. To help us do that, we have today Professor Tyler Vanderweel of Harvard University. Professor Vanderweel, thank you very much for joining us at the Expanded Recent Institute of the University of Francisco de Victoria here in Madrid. You're speaking to me from Oxford, where you're on sabbatical now. Before I begin, uh, before we begin, let me introduce you to our audience. Dr. Tyler Vanderbilt is, Vanderbilt is the John L. Loeb and Francis Lehman Loeb Professor of Epidemiology in the Departments of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. He's the Director of the Human Flourishing Program, Co-Director of the Initiative on Health, Religion and Spirituality at Harvard University, and the 2019-2020 George Eastman Visiting Professor at the University of Oxford. Eastman is in Kodak. He holds the degree. Uh, he holds degrees from the University of Oxford, University of Pennsylvania, and Harvard University in mathematics, philosophy, theology, finance and applied economics, and biostatistics. His research concerns methodology for distinguishing between association and causation in observational studies, and the use of statistical and counterfactual ideas to formalize and advance epidemiologic theory and methods. His empirical research spans psychiatric perinatal and social epidemiology, the science of happiness and flourishing, and the study of religion and health, including both religion and population health, and the role of religion and spirituality in end-of-life care. He is the recipient of the 2017 COPS President's Award from the Committee of Presidents of the Statistical Societies. He has published over 300 papers in peer re review journals, and is author of the book Explanation in, in Causal Inference, published by Oxford University Press. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for uh, having me. It's a pleasure being with you today. Let me begin by asking you about the Human Flourishing Program at Harvard and how its work was affected by the pandemic. I'm not asking, of course, about telecommuting, but rather about its mission. How was it affected, if at all, by, by this pandemic? So at the Human Flourishing, program at Harvard, what we're essentially trying to do is to take the set of empirical and, and statistical and, and social science techniques that are often used to study things like um, economic outcomes and um, cardiovascular disease, but to apply it to a much broader range of flourishing and well-being outcomes. Um, such as happiness and life satisfaction, or meaning and purpose, or character and virtue, or, or close social relationships. So we're trying to look at flourishing or well-being in a more holistic sense, and in a sense shaped by philosophical and theological tradition. So to develop measures of meaning and purpose or character that are informed by um, these rich philosophical and theological traditions. That goal has remained the same uh, throughout this current pandemic of COVID-19. We still want to study and understand and promote human flourishing. Um, but what has changed uh, are the means that we have uh, to promote these things. In much of our research, for example, we've shown that religious community powerfully affects these different aspects of flourishing, happiness, health, life satisfaction, meaning, purpose, character, social relationships, and yet we've seen throughout um, the world that religious services have been suspended um, in large part out of necessity to prevent uh, the infection from spreading further. Uh, but then what can be put in its place? These are some of the questions that we are uh, struggling with right now. Um, are these online services as effective? Um, how to sustain meaningful relationships often established within religious communities when all one has is virtual connection. These are these are difficult uh, questions, but I think these are important questions if we're going to continue to promote flourishing. Okay. Now, um, 
our audience is mostly or almost entirely university professors. So, uh, in, in for many of us, uh, moving from classroom teaching to online teaching happened suddenly uh, in the last few weeks. Uh, some have experienced some of it, uh, have some experience with it, but for many of us, this was the first time, and it was a rush to get going, and, and probably um, disconcerting in some ways. What would you say to 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 the uh, to people in in these educational um, uh, entities uh, institutions that are doing this for the first time, and especially to the professor that finds himself now or herself separated from the class from the from the students that he was used to or she was used to uh, engaging personally? Um, is there a word that you could to give to them on on these from from your work? Well, I, I certainly wouldn't consider myself an expert on um, online teaching, and I don't mean about the thing. But uh, but you know, I, I do think um, um, while trying to establish a new you know um, lecturing style and approach to engagement um, is important, um, I th and, and learning to use these technologies, um, I think just as important is also how to recreate. Um, some of the, the circumstances um, that exist in an in-person classroom setting um, that are much more difficult to achieve online. Um, subtle things such as, you know, what happens with the student discussions before and after um, the class takes place? Uh, is there a way to continue to encourage those more informal actions, interactions? Um, both for the purposes of, of building relationships amongst the students, but also for their you know, more informal exchange um, of ideas. I, I think um, trying to ensure um, you know, a, a format where there maybe is that sort of student interaction and discussion, perhaps with the professor absent, in fact, uh, would, be, uh, would, would be worthwhile. Um, you know, likewise, I think another somewhat um, intangible aspect of the teaching experience uh, which is difficult to, to replicate now that we've moved um, online is the handful of students who come up to um, the, 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 the professor afterwards with, um, with specific questions which they may not have been willing to ask in front of the, the entire class. Um, so finding ways to, to bring that about um, as well. You know, perhaps something like following the lecture, scheduling little um, five minute uh, sessions which students can sign up for in um, in a request in real time by um, by email to allow those um, those interactions because while the lecturing in the classroom material is is important I think many of these subtle ways in which people um, learn are, are often as important and we need to find ways to to replicate that moving on and now a little bit to um well, again, to, to the question of, of human flourishing, your program, and society at large. In the, in the, um, you work in the field of epidemiology, but biostatistics, and also economics. Um, can you tell us a little bit about um, the reality that we live in today um, from, from the perspective of human flourishing and some of the things that you've been looking at? So I mean, I think it's very clear that um, with regard to these different domains of flourishing, the economy is under threat, and physical health is is under threat, and 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 these these are real, um, uh, and and there are going to be losses. Um, we need to do the best we can to, to 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 confront them, to minimize the economic damage, to try to prevent the spread um, of of the virus. Um, but uh, and, and, and and these you know have rightly occupied a great deal of our of our effort. Um, but there are other aspects of human life and human flourishing um, that I think are important not to uh, neglect. There are there are social relationships. There are um, there's 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 mental health um, issues, not just you know, the risk of infection, but um, issues of depression and, and of anxiety. Um, also questions of meaning and purpose. How do we make sense of what is happening? 
And I, I think we need to devote adequate attention to these other issues. How do we promote uh, better relationships? Are there ways we can address some of these mental health issues, depression, anxiety, using um, online tools, online cognitive behavioral therapy? Um, how do we, as individuals and as communities, make sense of and find meaning in what is taking place? How do we find meaning um, in, in the suffering that is real and that is being experienced? Can and you connect that to some of your studies on prayer and spirituality that I, I know you've done? Yeah. Um, so, um, I, I, as I had indicated a little bit, Earlier, um, we've we've done a number of studies on um, uh, participation in religious community, religious service attendance, and um, the the effects on on sort of lowering um, depression, decreasing dramatically um, suicide rates, improving um, relationships, improving one's sense of, of meaning and and purpose um, in in life. And so I you know, I think those communities are are very um, important um, because participation in those is somewhat restricted now. I think moving towards um, practices like um, personal prayer and devotion or in the context of families, um, uh, you know, family uh, liturgies and, and devotions can, can be a, at least a partial um, substitute to, to try to address um, some of these issues. But you know, certainly within the um, Christian tradition, I think there are uh, profound reflections on um, on suffering itself and how to find meaning in suffering, how to um, reevaluate one's life, how to um, help others who are likewise um, suffering, how to um, you know, turn one's, one's will and attention um, uh, to God. And I think in the context of this present suffering, uh, many of those uh, theological resources are likewise going to be very helpful. You're on sabbatical, I understand now, at Oxford University. Um, you started last uh, August, I, I, I assume? Yeah. Did, 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 uh, did the pandemic, which at that point we weren't expecting, change anything of the work you're doing now? It, it did. Um, I had kind of been continuing along with uh, my sabbatical projects for some time, um, one of which was uh, devoted to a book on uh, a theology of health, not just health care, but health itself. Um, and then a, a second project, somewhat more technical in nature on issues of, of, of measurement, which we um, wrestle with when we're trying to assess things like um, suffering or meaning and purpose or, or spiritual well-being. Um, uh, but when, when um, the present pandemic uh, hit at least the West in full force, I, I felt some sense of obligation to shift at least some of my efforts um, to, to other research pursuits. And so um, some of that has been writing pieces on um, how we can try to flourish even in the midst of, of the present pandemic. Um, some of it's been oriented towards how religious communities can understand um, what's taking place and, and provide alternatives and prepare for the end of lockdown measures. Um, and then some of it has been more statistical in um, nature and um, sort of the need for better information and in the modeling that, that we're doing, more representative testing. So we actually know what infection rates are and what infection mortality rates are and how good the tests are, are performing. The fact that we don't know these things and that we're not doing representative testing um, makes the models very uncertain and there's a lot of variation which makes decision making very difficult. And given the economic and social costs of these lockdown measures, I think it's essential to have the best possible data upon which to make uh, these decisions. So a piece that was just published a few weeks ago in the American Journal of Public Health with some of my, along with some of my colleagues, um, walks through some of these issues and sort of advocates for putting better surveillance systems in, into place so that we have better data on which to make these, these important and critical decisions which affect so many different aspects of flourishing. Um, can I ask you a, this is a, this may sound as a personal question, it's more a, an, a, an intellectual personal question uh, or a personal question at an intellectual level. Um, your, your intellectual interests are 
very uh, unique in the sense that they span very different fields, very radically different fields. Um, can you explain to us or tell us a little bit about what brought you to, you know, from mathematics to theology, finance and economics to biostatistics and so on? How, what, where, where does it all, how did it all come together? A, a full description of that would occupy uh, <laughs> several hours, but I will try to condense it into a, as short a narrative as, as possible. But uh, essentially, the, my study of mathematics as an undergraduate led me to want to find um, applications of mathematics that would contribute um, to the well-being of, of the world, which pulled me first into finance and economics, and then later on into public health and to, to biostatistics. I, I pursued more technical studies, uh, more mathematically oriented studies in biostatistics and the development of methods to assess causation for a number of years, um, but was engaged in a number of epidemiologic projects on um, birth outcomes, on, on mental health, and on various other topics. Um, as I pursued that work, I eventually came to this question of the role of religious community in promoting health and well-being. I discovered there was a large research literature on this, but many open questions with regard to causation, which was my methodologic focus. Um, and so I began to pursue uh, work on religious uh, communities and health and well-being using sort of the most rigorous possible data and the most rigorous possible methods. Um, and that, that work showed that weekly religious service attendance would reduce 10-year mortality rates by 30%, reduce rates of depression by 30% over time, reduce suicide rates by five-fold. So these were large effects on important outcomes. Um, and we really don't talk about the role of religious communities in shaping population health very often. Um, that then led to this question of what else shapes population health, which we don't adequately study. So that led to work on parenting practices and on forgiveness. And then I began to think, what outcomes do people care about that we are not adequately studying? We study very well economic outcomes and, and health outcomes. And people care deeply about these things, but they also care about being happy, about meaning and purpose, about trying to be a good person, about the relationships. Um, and so I thought, why don't we use the same set of rigorous empirical methods to try to examine these other aspects of well-being, of flourishing, as we do with um, physical health and, and economic um, outcomes. And that's what led four years ago to the formation of the Human Flourishing Program uh, and, and uh, this, this empirical study of, of flourishing informed by philosophical and theological traditions. So that's, uh, I guess, a very brief summary uh, of, the, of the overall trajectory. Are so, students, um, undergraduate students or graduate students involved in these projects? Yeah, we, we've had a number of um, graduate students, um, especially, um, carry out work on, on different aspects of, um, uh, of, of flourishing and of, of, of well-being. Um, we have had some undergraduate uh, participation as well. We've hosted some um, summer seminars, and um, we've, we've also uh, taught uh, some four-credit uh, courses within Harvard College um, on, on these topics. Uh, most of our work is focused on on research, um, and so we've had more substantial interaction with uh, graduate students and, and postdoctoral fellows. But we do have an educational aim uh, as as well, and so we have had some some interaction with undergraduates also. Okay. Um, one last last question about um, uh, returning back to the uh, to the to the initial issue of uh, human flourishing. The um, The work of a university professor uh, anywhere is often um, understood in either, well, not either or, but oftentimes happens to be oriented towards a, um, the formation, towards a, 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 a degree requirement so that a student can achieve a job. We would like to say that we, uh, and many of us who are involved in education beyond, in, in um, thinking of it as pure professional formation, we're thinking about the, the human formation of the, of the person, the, the development of the mind, critical thinking, and so on. Um, what advice would you give to a professor that is just beginning to uh, uh, thinking about the, their own vocation as a professor, um, who may be a professor in a very um, scientific field or very technical field, and 
how would you in, uh, encourage them to move beyond towards, to use the, the words of Pope Benedict, to, to broaden the horizon of reason, to, to, to look at their field of study and the work that they do with students beyond just the pure technical aspect, but more towards a, um, well, to cure, towards human flourishing, both for themselves and for the student. I think it's a very good question and um, one which has no easy answer. I, I think um, the advice I would give um, and the approach I've tried to take myself is that really throughout one's work, throughout one's career, one's research, one's teaching, um, to from time uh, to time, uh, an hour or two a week, um, maybe even devoting a, a week during each year um, to come back to questions with regard to how is my work related to, to broader questions of flourishing and human well-being? And also, what is the relationship overall of my discipline um, to questions of flourishing? and? Um, um, and, and, and to faith or to religious understanding. Um, and I think that continual process of coming back to those um, big picture questions over time, um, again and again, uh, begins to help shape the mind to think in new ways, to, um, to, to pursue um, new questions, to realize how one's um, deepest theological or philosophical beliefs and positions might go on to inform uh, one's work. And, and I think that process uh, typically does not take place with a single epiphany. Um, it, it takes place through developing um, habits and by returning to these questions um, again and again. In my own experience from my early graduate student days, um, I was really wrestling with how does my Christian faith relate to my academic work? And for a long time, I really had no answers, but kept struggling, kept asking those questions, kept trying to talk to others um, uh, 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 about these matters. And you know, it was really only, I would say 10 years later that um, some of these connections began to come together in a, in a clearer way. Um, and I began to see a way forward where the content of my day-to-day -day work was being informed um, by my deepest beliefs. Um, but I still very much see myself uh, on uh, that, that journey. And, and every year um, that goes on, uh, you know, I see uh, deeper connections and, um, and new uh, research pursuits. Um, uh, the, the newest undertaking of the Human Flourishing Program is going to be to try to develop a, a philosophically and, and theologically adequate assessment approach uh, to, to, to love, um, which I think is central in human flourishing. Very difficult to um, you know, wrap one's head around the diversity of the ways that that word, that concept is is used and, and <laughs> challenging moreover to, to attempt to, to measure it. But I think if we're really going to improve um, the well-being and the ultimate well-being of our, our world in substantial ways, we, we need to understand these things. Um, but I would have never anticipated um, undertaking uh, such work uh, 15 years ago. So for me, it really has been a, you know, a gradual um, process, but I think one that can only come about by um, persistent effort and by returning again and again to those questions which may at present seem tangential to one's day-to-day -day work, but there are probably deeper connections than one realizes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Van der Weel, for your, um, your words and for joining us at the Expanded Reason Institute at the University of Francisco Victoria in Madrid.